Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out today. We're really grateful for you tuning in. And if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully you have subscribed so that you never miss an episode. But if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com or whatever it is you're listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalogue of previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations and we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private facebook group forums area and whatsapp chat groups it's like a netflix social media platform for animal behavior nerds but we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one kathy sadeo kathy is an applied animal behaviorist she's been a full-time animal trainer for, for 30 years first working with marine mammals and now with dogs and their people at the university of hawaii kathy received a master's degree as part of a research team which trained dolphins to solve complex cognitive puzzles She then worked for the United States Navy to train dolphins for open ocean tasks. Next, Kathy worked as a marine mammal trainer at the Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium in Tacoma, Washington. After leaving the zoo world, Kathy created Tacoma's first dog daycare. Since 1998, Kathy has owned Bright Spot Dog Training. Services include consulting with families about their challenging dogs and mentoring professional trainers who want to maximize the power of positive reinforcement training. Kathy is proud to be an original faculty member for Karen Pryor's Clicker Expo and has taught at 38 of these popular conferences. Kathy has traveled extensively across the United States. Canada and Europe, into Australia, Israel, Japan, Japan, and Mexico. In 2012, Kathy published her first book, Plenty in Life is Free, Reflections on Dogs, Training, and Finding Grace. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome one Kathy Sadeo to the Animal Training Academy podcast show today. Kathy is patiently waiting by. Kathy, how are you and smudge? I am great. Smudge is um, busily pacing around. You might hear his nails ticking in the background. So uh, we're doing we're doing great. How about you, Ray? <laughs> I'm doing very well, thank you. Had a couple of cups of coffee. Phoebe is waiting by, knowing that stationing behavior while Daddy stares at screens and talks to random faces means Zewi Peak get delivered to mouth. So very nice. Hopefully, uh, she is content and. Uh, we won't hear her through the podcast. <laughs> we'll see how we go. <laughs> Let's dive straight into the first question today, Kathy. Could you please take all of us back to where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training and share some stories from that time and some of the first animals you ever trained? So I have a weird um, history in that the first animal I ever trained was a harbor seal. Uh, at the aquarium where I grew up in Niagara Falls, New York. Um, I lucked into this field uh, kind of serendipitously. I took a um, course in college, an elective psychology course in animal behavior. Um, I was a biology major. I was going to be a doctor. I had my whole future planned out. And uh, the professor of that undergraduate uh, psychology course, Dr. Pat Ebert, Um, needed an assistant at the aquarium in Niagara Falls to do some observational work uh, with uh, some of the animals there. And so I just did that as, uh, you know, fulfilling my elective and uh, didn't realize I would 
fall in love with the subject matter and also really fall in love with this teacher who was passionate and just was turning me on to fields of learning I never even knew existed. Uh, so my senior thesis as an undergraduate was uh, doing a training project with two little harbor seals that were at the aquarium and just were going without training. So another student and I put together some, I can't even remember the project. It was so long ago. It was 1981 um, on doing some training with them, but I really just wanted to do some training period. I think it had to do with targeting. It was something really simple. And uh, what came from that first little uh, taste of training was how fascinating I found it. Um, And so the next animal I trained uh, was later when I, got accepted as a graduate student at the University of Hawaii to work at their Koala Basin Marine Mammal Laboratory teaching sign language to bottlenose dolphins. Um, So the first animal I ever worked with extensively was a bottlenose dolphin. And that's a strange first animal to learn training about. So when you say, how were you first exposed to positive reinforcement training? I wouldn't have even called it that. I didn't know there were other options. There really weren't other options. And so we just called it training. Um, I had a fantastic training supervisor at the time. She was smart and tough. And I regret that I didn't at the time uh, see how brilliant she was. Her name was Jean Asumi, and she was a senior graduate student. And she had to take me and every other brand new graduate student that said, yay, we're working with dolphins. Oh my gosh, we're in Hawaii. We were just goofy. And uh, she had to teach us the rigors of not only training animals, but training them for really complex Uh, cognitive projects, that meant our training had to be incredibly precise um, because the success of those research studies was riding on our ability to um, give our cues clearly and consistently and saliently, um, but also to control for the clever Hans effect where the dolphins we were asking questions of might give us the right answer because we, that researchers were inadvertently cueing them. So it's kind of a funny first introduction to training, because I think it was a lot more rigorous than many of my colleagues who start with dogs, which makes sense. But I think that's a more forgiving context to start as a trainer. I think you have a lot more options on training methods that are going to work to some extent, because the species that you start training with is somewhat forgiving to fairly sloppy training. So when you start with a dolphin or a fish or a parrot or a cat, I think your introduction to the options in training are a little different than if you start by training a dog. So in a lot of ways, I was incredibly lucky. So you're in Hawaii, extremely excitable (laughs) with, uh, was it Gina Sumu? Is that how you say her name? I haven't thought about her in a long time. It's funny, Ryan, as I'm telling this story, I, because she was really um, tough on us. And I think we were like, oh, she's hard to work for. And she was actually a fantastic first teacher in what training looks like, right? How to do it well. And so tell us a story about teaching sign language to dolphins. (laughs) Uh, um, A story that makes us look good or a story that makes us story about teaching sign language to dolphins. Um, Hmm. I'm trying to select which one um, is illustrative of what that all was like. Um, One of my clearest memories is when I first uh, got to the University of Hawaii, and I'm extremely excited. This research facility is at the end of Ala Moana Beach in Honolulu. I mean, it's in the most stunning location, and I'm doing this really cool thing. And the first assignment that a new graduate student has at that research lab is to be a noun, meaning the dolphins were responding to objects in their tank, um, which were nouns in their sign language, uh, be a surfboard and a hoop and a basket and a person. So you as a new graduate student got to be the person floating in the tank that the dolphin could move around in response to the sentence that the trainer, uh, the researcher signaled. Um, but the big uh, news to me was um, dolphins don't like to be wrong, or at least our dolphins didn't like to be wrong. They weren't wrong that often, um, but they didn't really like it. And so when you were floating in the tank after they'd gotten something wrong, you weren't exactly all that safe. So... <laughs> 
<laughs> one of your jobs was to um, get out of the tank right now because um, we're having a frustrated dolphin. Looking back on it, I think we could have minimized the learner's frustration. But at that point, I'm like, what do you mean I have to get out of the tank? She looks happy. Well, they always look happy. That's how their faces are built. They look like they're smiling even when they're not so happy. So anyway, I have a very clear memory of like, wow, I've made it all the way to Hawaii to float in a pool to be kind of analogous to the basket that's floating next to me. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, I told this story at Clicker Expo um, just last month in um, Washington, D.C. I don't remember the question that prompted the story on the panel discussion, but it comes from the same time at the research lab. Those dolphins learned um, many different advanced sort of conceptual problems and um, One of my memories is the frustration that they had, uh, one of the dolphins in particular, Phoenix, at learning what to us researchers was an extremely simple task. So we were teaching uh, two-dimensional visual matching the sample, straightforward, easy to understand, even if you don't know what that um, research paradigm looks like. A trainer would show Phoenix, one of the bottlenose dolphins, a um, shape, a white shape painted on a piece of black painted plywood. So you've got a piece of plywood painted black. There's a white triangle, circle, or square. We show it to Phoenix. We take the sample away. Three other people put in the choices that she can pick from, circle, square, triangle, white shape on a black plywood, and they show it to her. And we can't get this very sophisticated dolphin who understands an underwater acoustic language and many other really slick learning tasks. We can't get her to be above chance on this task. And we're really frustrated. And I remember the research meeting we got together. We're like, what are we going to do? And the uh, geniuses in the room (laughs) um, say, hey, for the first time, why don't we try using a no reward marker? Why don't we point out to Phoenix when she's wrong? Maybe she's not really clear when she's wrong, which I'm laughing as I'm saying this because um, the absence of a marker and a smelt, our whistle and a fish, food fish after that, that was plenty of information she was wrong, right? The absence of reinforcement. But we say, no, 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 let's, let's come up with a sound. We can pipe through the underwater speakers. These underwater speakers weighed a couple of hundred pounds. They were reject equipment from the U.S. Navy. We took that equipment. This is in the mid-1980s, a long time ago. So we have underwater speakers, and we play a random sound, which is contingent on her choosing the wrong thing. So we show her a white triangle. We pull the triangle away. We give her the three choices. She chooses the square. We play the underwater sound, and there's no fish. We think, well, this will help her learn it. I don't remember the timeline, but it wasn't very long until one of the most memorable things ever happened to me in training, one of the most frightening things. So Phoenix is in that, you know, um, collecting data session and she gets something wrong and we play that innocuous sound and um, she starts swimming around the tank really fast, big zooming loops around the tank and water is sloshing out the side of the circular tank and we're not sure what's happening, but she's clearly agitated and she's swimming fast and we've clearly lost her attention, but we've never seen her do this. And she takes her tail flukes and she lifts those 200 pounds of speakers out of the water and she shoots them out of the tank. They are now projectile like shrapnel. So they go flying. There's a bunch of people standing around the tank doing this research. The speakers crash to the concrete surrounding the tank and they shatter. And, you know, by the grace of God, nobody was killed. It was incredibly intense. I would call it anger. That's what it looked like to me. Contingent on us saying, hey, you know, you got that wrong. Um, We never thought about using a no reward marker again. I realize it's not exactly data, it's an anecdote, but it was such a clear illustration of the cost of a poor teaching strategy. So the end of the story, the reason I take the time to tell you this now, and also a clicker expo is the solution to the problem was entirely different. So did Phoenix ever learn the task? She sure did. When we realized we hadn't presented the question to her very well, someone had the bright idea in one of the research meetings, it certainly wasn't me, uh, what is two-dimensional in a dolphin's world? Why are we presenting this visual matching to sample task as a two-dimensional stimulus basically a flat piece of wood. What would happen if we took the shapes, the white shapes, cut them out and put them on a dowel so that they sort of popped out from the background a little bit? So the white shape would be sort of three-dimensionally removed from the black background. Would that change her performance? 
it changed it immediately. It wasn't like a learning curve. It was like she went, oh, there's a white shape there. I totally can do that. And of course, we easily could shorten the dowel over training sessions to fade into having it be two-dimensional. She did fine. Our illusion as teachers was we really have to point out to her where she's wrong. And the complete mistake there has stayed with me in that when my learner isn't succeeding, it has less to do with them being unclear on their, their being wrong. They're very sensitive to being wrong. They totally recognize the absence of a marker signal. Um, what is more the case is we presented that problem to them in a way that doesn't easily lead them to success. Now that was a long time ago. I'm kind of embarrassed to tell the story because it seems really obvious in retrospect. A lot of smart people in the room that it wasn't obvious as we were living it and were frustrated. So one more story from the mid 1980s and half your listeners weren't even born. So there you go. And in the host as, as well. As, indeed. Um, and I mean, it's, you say it sounds so obvious, but was, was it in the 1980s? I mean, I can't even imagine. Like when I started training, I didn't even really have the internet and all of the, these resources and, um, you know, being able to produce a podcast show and bring your stories from Clicker Expo to Australia and New Zealand because, Kathy, just in case you are in a faculty meeting and you do talk about hosting it down here, then just, you know, put that in there. Um, but we don't get okay. that, those stories <laughs> down here. So, I mean, and was it was it obvious in the 90s? 1980s in the early 1980s. I mean, how did you how did you disseminate information? How did you connect with other trainers? Connect with other trainers? Are you kidding? <laughs> we were a research lab. We don't share our. Oh my gosh, everything was a big fat secret. And I went from working at the University of Hawaii as a graduate student to working for the Navy, and the work was classified. So not only were you professionally sort of not going to share my secrets, you actually couldn't share anything legally. It was nothing you could talk about. That work is not classified any longer. I can talk about my Navy work, but there wasn't sharing. Sharing wasn't a thing. <laughs> sharing. Huh. We would go to professional conferences. I remember International Marine Animal Trainers Association, IMATA, which still is exists. Um, and certainly there would be some sharing. <laughs> but I don't think you shared all your secrets and how you did all the fancy stuff. So I, yeah, uh, how did we get information? We talked to each other. We read research papers at the university. And remember, our emphasis wasn't as trainers. Training was what you had to do to get to the end goal, which is to show dolphins had rudimentary language. I mean, that was what we were questioning, right? And it was the time that so much of the primate language uh, research was contaminated by Clever Hun's problems that the researchers didn't even know about. So it was a time where uh, people were really skeptical that animals had any kind of uh, language capabilities. So we were determined to show that even in rigorous testing, um, they did. So yeah, that's my introduction to training. Yeah, amazing. And, and wow, I, I have a visualization of Phoenix shooting these speakers up into the air. Like, where were you standing when they happened? I felt like I was really close, but I was probably about 30 feet away. It was so sudden. It was such a, she was fine. She was working. She was there. She was, yeah, I'm going to say it. She was furious, absolutely furious. And it's really hard to um, stop a data collection session. Like, data is everything. It was complete silence. I mean, there was like absolutely nobody's moving. There was a moment of like, is anybody hurt? The speakers are dead. Okay, we're, we have to regroup. Like it was such an obvious, the learner going, hey, get, knock it off. Let's try something else. Oh my goodness. Anyway, that's a long time ago. And I, yeah, I remember it still. You don't really want to make your, anger, your learner that angry anytime, any species. I feel like uh, no reward markers uh, come up a lot and there's confusion about uh, their use. So that's going to just really be itched in my brain every anytime someone brings no reward markers up again to kind of say, hey, go listen to that podcast with Kathy Sadeo and get, get this uh, anecdotal story of uh, potentially what the label furious might look like. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a fruitful conversation to have about no reward markers and Data is one thing, but anecdotes matter. So, yeah, I'll never forget that one. 
So there's so much uh, interesting stuff that's happened in your career between then and now. But we, one thing you mentioned in there was uh, talking about your use of cues and learning about cues at that time. And I know that's something you really wanted to talk about today. So I'm so keen to ask you about your time in the Navy and all of this kind of stuff. But let's let's push on because we've only got limited time in this podcast and we could probably talk for days. So just before we do that, bring us up to speed. I'm, I'm interested in giving you, you an opportunity to tell the listeners what you're up to now and uh, where they can go to find out more information, your website, et cetera, and then we're going to go talk about cues, everyone. Yeah, easiest thing. My website is my name, kathysdeo.com. I'm less than stellar at updating my website, but now that I've said it to you, Ryan, I will make sure at least my upcoming seminar schedule and webinar schedule is um, up to date. So uh, I travel about once a month to teach a seminar um, and yeah, book for the next couple of years. So maybe I'm coming to a city near you, listener, um, and also doing some webinars and kind of excited. I'll do my first webinar um, for uh, Denise Fenzi's group um, in July. So that's kind of cool new um, venue for a webinar for me. Um, and yeah, I do about half my business is traveling, teaching workshops and seminars. And about half of it is a really active consultation business here in Tacoma, Washington. So I want to be able to, I'm tempted sometimes to go, oh, those individual people and their uh, dogs' behavior problems. I had interesting cases yesterday. Tuesday, yesterday is my intake day for new clients, and both of my clients were very interesting yesterday. And so sometimes I think, huh, I wonder if I still need to do that. It's hard work to meet people where they have their needs, right? The world is endlessly fascinating. And so the consultation cases I get are never boring, right? So it's never like, oh, yawn, I totally know that. It keeps me on my toes. Um, but I fear that if I didn't work with um, individual consultation clients, I would lose the authenticity of talking to people. I think it's really easy to get an ivory tower about the academic side of, of training, which is cool and fascinating. But then the rubber really meets the road when you bring that to someone's behavior problem of, that little, um, it was a, let me see, let me see if I can remember it. It was a Chorky in my office, Ryan. It was a Chorky, which is a Chihuahua Yorkie, who had the shrillest bark I think I've ever heard. It was eardrum splitting. And suffice it to say, the, um, the owner had trained that to incredible fluency accidentally. So there is a lot of uh, Morky, Yorkie, Chorky. It's a Chorky, Ryan. Chorky screaming in that woman's house. So that's the other thing I'm doing. So if you live near Tacoma, Washington, yeah, I work with private clients and uh, so nothing uh, super new, just keeping on doing what I'm really blessed to be doing, which is working with folks in a subject I really love and I'm never bored by. So that's pretty lucky. Most definitely, and uh, glad to give you some accountability to update your schedule. So, <laughs> <That's> uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll link to that in the show notes, everyone. But once again, Fantastic. it's uh, just kathysadeo.com, so pretty easy to find. Hey, thanks so much for sharing everything so far, Kathy. Uh, we love hearing people's behavior odysseys, as we like to call them. So, appreciation to you <laughs> for just sharing all of that with us. Uh, moving forward, as mentioned, we'd really like to talk about cues now. Is this is something you mentioned to me you really wanted to unpack in today's episode, talk about what they are and what they're not. So let's start with the first part there. In Kathy Sedeo's words, what are, what are cues and why was this an important topic for you today? Um, cues. Uh, stimuli in the environment, the learner recognizes as uh, leading to a reinforcement opportunity. Information in the environment pointing to the opportunity for the animal to behave, to gain a reinforcer. Um, the I'll use uh, Dr. Susan Friedman's term, the cultural fog around cues versus commands is so dense that even the tiniest bit of clarity about what cues actually are and how they function in the world um, to pull out the actual science of cueing from what living as a human being in the world tells us about how to get animals to do things, how to get people to do things, that little bit of clarity goes a huge way in training. So when I'm trying to help colleagues, professionals improve their training skills, 
this to me is the most fruitful area to do some learning around. Um, I remember many years ago, uh, I think my colleague and friend Grisha Stewart would not mind if I said, gosh, this may be as 10 years ago that she hosted me at her facility in Seattle, Washington, Ahimsa. Uh, dog training. She hosted a seminar uh, that I taught on cueing. And I remember getting together with her at, like the coffee break after uh, we taught a little bit about the difference between cues, opportunities for your learner to gain a reinforcer by doing a particular behavior within a certain window of time, and commands, signals in the environment that tell a, a learner, you have to do this or else I'm going to make you. There's a threat implied with every command. And a cue and a command can sound exactly the same. They could look exactly the same. It's not that down is a cue to a dog and plots is a command. It has to do with the learning history associated with those signals. Um, and so I was talking to Grisha about, you know, the difference between cues being requests that an animal learner can say no to and commands, something that the trainer, the handler, the issuer of the command is going to back up with some kind of force. Um, Grisha said, that's not good news. Like that doesn't make me happy. I want to have the power to tell an animal to do something. Like that feels really good. And I said, I know that's exactly right. We want to be able to have that reliable, fluent response from anybody we ask to do anything. I'm with you. But the way to do that is to be really careful about building your cues in a way that gives them power. But their power comes from their association with reinforcement. They're not powerful on their own. And that idea that our goal is to reliably, powerfully, precisely link our chosen cues, the ones that come out of the trainer's mouth or often out of their hands as a gesture, that we want those cues to be really tightly linked with positive reinforcement, real positive reinforcement, the kind that matters to each individual learner, that that's a priority for us in our training, that word has not gotten out into the broader world. The broader world looks at animal behavior especially, but human behavior as well, as being a result of antecedents, as being a result of careful explanations and how you hold your body when you talk and that you want to look assertive and have a certain kind of energy. And we put all our eggs in the antecedent basket, how we issue the commands or the instructions, instead of saying, really, we do much better to build up a strong reinforcement history for that behavior and then link our signal with that strong reinforcement history, our chosen cue, hopefully carefully chosen cue. We've thought about it ahead of time. We've thought about what's going to be salient and something we can give consistently and something that's distinctive. All those parameters of a good cue, we know about. That's not news, but we don't tend to do it because we're using language to ask our animals to do something. And as soon as we drop into language, we're used to commanding each other. We're used to demanding things from each other. That's sort of at least the world I grew up in. So to have this mindfulness initially about what a cue is, what it can do, the power that comes only from its linking to the positive reinforcement, that's nice. You can sort of hang on to that idea at Clicker Expo or during our podcast conversation, but then we go out and we live in the world in that cultural fog Susan Friedman talks about, and we go, yeah, that's not actually how the world works. Behavior is a product of antecedents is what the world tells us. Us. And then we go back to our science and we go, no, 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 no. The dog sits when we ask the dog to sit, not because we had good energy and we were confident and we said, sit. The dog sits when we ask them to sit because either in the past when they've done that, they've gained positive reinforcers or they've been avoided positive punishment. There's something good has come to them either by gaining something they value or shutting off something they don't value. That's why the dog sits. The cue the command simply signals to them when to do it. So that idea, I think we put too much faith in, too much um, respect into the cues, and we start there because that's what comes first. Uh, you know, consequences, the cause that works backwards, this temporal sequence of behavior is functional. It's driven by consequences. Behavior is a way animals, people produce consequences in the environment. Boy, nobody knows that. Or if they know it, they don't live like that's true. So we keep reminding ourselves and reminding our students and our clients 
It's really the way the world works. And you, Ryan, and your podcast and me and my work, we really want people to understand that because it changes lives. It sounds like this arcane bit of science, like yawn. It will change how you live if you say, my job is to be a fantastic reinforcer, not a fantastic enforcer. So certainly in the dog training community, that is the dichotomy. Are you a leader? Are you a good leader? Are you alpha, Ryan? And you've got your hierarchy straightened out with the dogs in your family. And that's the story that's never going to die. It's so sticky. It's like going to live beyond me for sure. Maybe even beyond you, young man, that idea that your job with your dog is to be a good enforcer or leader. Go forth. Be a really great reinforcer. Learn everything you can about reinforcement. That's where our strong uh, suit is. That's where our skills can get better. The idea that we want to ask animals to do things at particular times. Yep, that's why we put cues on behaviors, but it isn't where we start and it isn't where our power is. And we never want to forget that. And even I forget that. So yeah, we're, we're out to get that word out because it's, it, it changes things. It changes everything about what a training session with any animal looks like. So thinking about cultural fog and uh, our learning history, <laughs> our being the collective uh, homo sapien, uh, we are reinforced for com- using commands, commands being, hey, learner, do this thing, you have no choice. Um, let's say we have clients who just want to fix their problem uh, and we've got to reinforce, we've got to communicate to them reinforcement is the way be be a reinforcing entity how what have you found has been successful like acknowledging that they've got a reinforcement history for commands using commands uh they're probably not as motivated like you said to get as geeky as we do like where where is the uh common ground there that we can start to kind of build that conversation on it's a great question and and my answer to that oh my god it's in such flux right now feel like I've been doing this for three decades. I should sort of like have it down. Like I should know what I'm doing. And uh, each year that goes by, I feel a little less sure about all my easy certainties. And that conversation about how to present that information in a way that's nonviolent. And I know our conversation is going to talk a little bit about that. But what would it actually look like to give my human client all the unconditional positive regard, all the choice, all the non-coercion that I'm absolutely comfortable giving to the dogs who come in my office. I am fluent at giving the dog absolutely unconditional positive regard. Doesn't matter how bad the aggression, like that dog has worth and that behavior is coming from a learning history. And yet I'm still struggling um, with how to have the conversation with the client when I feel like I have the right answer. Like I'm not comfortable saying that, but I feel like I'm right. Like I have the right answer. Um, But Anytime I'm going to resist what they're bringing to me in terms of less than ideal training methods, um, if I resist what they're doing, it will persist, right? So anything you resist persists. And I sometimes feel like I've braced myself against a client. Um, I've got a six month relationship now with a wonderful client, brilliant woman, um, whose border collie came to me after severely biting an elderly woman at a local business in the parking lot. Paramedics had to respond. It's a very long story. I won't get into all the details, but um, that young border collie has worn a shock collar for a year and a half because the obedience instructor said that's how you get a good stay. And so the conflict that happens when the dog who's bitten comes to me and I want to have a conversation with a woman. I'm so glad she's here, but uh, the shock collar is part of the problem in my estimation. And so how do I say, um, I want to have a conversation with you, not only about cues versus commands, that's a big piece of what I'm going to talk to her about how many of her signals to that border collie are poisoned by the presence of the shock collar. What does a poison cue look like? What does that mean for her life with the dog who's now afraid of people so much that I had to work in protected contact, which I rarely do with my client's dogs, but I can't get near that dog yet. So how do I um, respect her coming to me with um, success? Success using that um, shock collar. Um, what does success look like? Um, the d- Border Collie was the star in the obedience class, uh, held a sit stay in the middle of a field while other dogs ran around in remote control cars, went around the dog and they threw meat at the dog and the dog didn't move. And yay. Wow. Maybe there's other definitions of success. Like you can walk the dog through the neighborhood. Um, so as we have that conversation, I realize it has to bubble up through my client uh, that there are alternatives. What does that look like? Let me just tell you one other quick thing that happened in my office yesterday. This 
is actually really odd. I hope other consultants listening have these odd moments where you say, I've had this client for many years. I feel like we're talking on the same page. And yet, uh, my client, Murray, said to me yesterday, now when my dogs are barking, they've, uh, he and his wife have recently adopted two young pit bulls from the Seattle shelter. They're lovely. Here's the question uh, yesterday. Um, when the gardeners come to work on our lawn at our house, they're there for three hours and they bring all the power tools and the girls, the pit bulls, are going crazy at the window barking and it's just so loud and they're so chaotic and we we don't really know what to do. And so I'm thinking, he said, I can just grab their faces and tell them, you must stop this right now. And he said, it works for a few minutes. You know, they will actually stop. So is that positive reinforcement? He says to me, and I'm like, what does it matter if it's called positive reinforcement? How are you feeling about doing this? Man that I know is well bought into positive reinforcement training, loves his dogs. It gets to your question, Ryan, which is why would he consider doing that? It's not effective for the three hours. The gardeners are there. Why is he thinking about doing that forceful thing to his dogs? Because it works for a few minutes. It's immediate reinforcement for him. He gets a little peace and quiet for a couple of minutes from the chaos. So again, instead of going... I don't think that's very nice. And no, you're out of the positive reinforcement club now, Murray, to have a conversation about, wow, how frustrating that must be for you. That's noisy. And it's hard to watch the dogs be so upset. And can we brainstorm a few other ways that we might be able to give them um, some feeling of safety rather than going that route? It isn't whether that's a right or wrong technique. It's about how it's going to meet your needs in the long run for creating trust and bonding between these dogs who are new to your house. So for me, that answer in terms of, it was a long answer to your, how do you get that across when there's so much confusion with as much in the moment empathy and laughter as I can, because we are all in that cultural fog. I used to kind of think I'm outside looking at the fog you're in. And really, if you stop and think about it, gosh, I'm right in that fog with you. This is a crazy world that we've evolved to be reinforced by the immediate results of our behavior, which is bad global warming. I mean, we're really not designed to take into account long-term consequences of our behavior. It may kill us as a species in the end. And so to be able to go, gosh, we are quirky. I'm listening right now to an audio book is the history of the work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky on all the ways our brains are not rational. We are not rational um, behaviors or deciders. And as you think about that, you go, oh, we're all in this thing together. Let's take a look at what options we have here to be able to say, gosh, once you've got some cues in your repertoire, real unpoisoned cues, why do we want that? For purity's sake, so you'll be in the club? It's a positive reinforcement club and you won't be in it if you're using commands? No, because cues allow you to do every interesting thing in the animal training world, which is building reliable behavior chains. Anybody looking at any kind of cool applied animal work is typically looking at a behavior chain, not one discreet behavior. Uh, my dear friend, friend Michelle Pouliot and her incredible career as a freestyler. I was looking on Facebook yesterday at the ribbons her dogs have won. Her freestyle routines with her dogs are phenomenal. What does a freestyle routine with a dog look like? An incredibly long behavior chain that Michelle puts together with such pizzazz and elegance and brilliance that we can't stop watching her freestyle routines. If you want to build a behavior chain, you better have cues. And if you want cues, you better not be using force to contaminate those cues and make them be either commands or poison cues. Not for the sake of purity, for our own efficacy. We want to be really efficient trainers. So even the pet owners coming into my office, I want to be able to try to give them a glimpse of what that might look like give them the confidence that I can help them get there and then give them the choice whether they want to do it or not. Not everybody wants to. Not everybody's ready. And that's a hard thing for me. It's a very hard thing for me to not um, win every time uh, with every client. So you could say you want to command them. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> what I realized. positive reinforcement. You know, the more I've been studying nonviolent communication in the last couple of years in order to present it at Clicker Expo and because it's where my passions really lie, it's been really humbling. Because exactly what you just said, I have found I'm a very pleasant commander. Like I can smile and still command you. Like you, we've got a mistake about what a command actually is backed up with any force at all. And so to really give people the choice, yeah, that's something I'm still working on. So you see, 
Anything you resist persists. That's an Eckhart Tolle line. So you yeah. want, yeah, if you know. I'm very recently to Eckhart Tolle, again, in my 50s. Where has he been all my life? Right there. I just missed him. But The Power of Now, and uh, I can't think of the next book. Uh, New World? Uh, oh, I'm quoting him wrong. I, I think they're phenomenal books for life, but I also think they speak to training. And I wouldn't say Eckhart Tolle came up with that concept of what you resist persists. I think it's pretty um, foundational to Buddhism, but I'm not an expert in Buddhism. But I, yeah, that idea, martial arts based on, you know, you brace against something, you're actually strengthening that thing, thing you're bracing against. Yeah, and it's not actually the first time that the power of now and Eckhart Tolle have been brought up in this podcast. Uh, Shirag Patel. Yay! Shirag and I are both, yeah, <laughs> Eckhart geeks. <laughs> I love Shirag. And we just had a talk about Eckhart Tolle, and I think I can. I think I can say this on the podcast. Can I? Yes, I think I can. My dear, you can. I can be brilliant friend mind. Emily Johnson Bay, the amazing Swedish trainer. Oh love my gosh! Uh, many years ago, was sitting at a lunch at Clicker Expo, and, Ek- and Shirag and I are going off about how much we love the power of now. Now and and <laughs> Emily, my dear friend, just does the eye roll. I just see her do the eye roll. I'm like, what? You're not a big fan. She's like, oh, come on. That's so, you know, just, you know, kind of facile, you know, that's just pop stuff. And I'm like, hmm, have you listened to it? <laughs> have you read it? So we, yeah, Shirag and I were both sort of nudging her. Maybe she would take a look at the <laughs> book one more time. I'm not sure if she did. <laughs> We'll find out. Um, anything you resist persists. There's a saying in crucial conversations as well. It is those who are forced against their will are of their own opinion still. Is that the same thing? Like unless unless the client understands and takes that initiative themselves and that, and therefore is not commanded. Yes, not even subtly. So, so for me, I'm pretty subtly like, here's the right answer and there's your answer. And you have this false choice of like, this is obviously the right, humane and kind way to do it. And your way of whatever you're doing it. Yeah, that's, I don't know. I just, I, I, I'm only recently aware, you know, because consultations can be so short and people are paying me money. I want to get information out, you know, like your money's worth makes me not always be a great listener and not always give people the time to have the idea themselves and to pick it up and me to support them picking it up. I'm getting better at that. But it comes from reading crucial conversations um, and studying nonviolent communication, which is very clear on how you make requests of people. And it's, yeah, it's different than I've ever done. So... So then you mentioned there time is short, time can be short in a consultation and they're giving you their money uh, and this might not facilitate the behavior of being what we could label as a great listener. Is that, is that potentially an approximation that we can take? Is what an approximation? Listening. Yeah. And, and I'm even going to read some right now. I'm pulling it up. Hang on. I've got some specific. Yeah. So this is some suggestions from um, the book, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, the founder of NVC, often called a particular format for, yeah, getting coercion out of our verbal and written communications. Um, here's just some suggestions for phrasing. So let me throw some phrases at you from that book. I'm trying to integrate almost as a script you know, when I first start off with new language, it's it's like following a cookbook recipe. I'm going to follow the recipe to the letter because I'm not fluent at it yet. I'm not using my own words. So here's just some of the possible phrases for listening better in my consultations. Um, do you have a sense I've heard you or is there more you'd like me to understand? I'm really curious about this. May I ask you a few questions? Um, I have a suggestion. Would you like to hear my suggestion now? Or would you prefer to continue telling me more of the story? Those sound small, but I'm much more likely to look at my watch, calculate how much time I have left, and I've got to explain some behavior modification principle to you before you drive away from my office and just jump in. Now that may feel familiar to people, like your doctor does that, or but I don't know. I want to have a different context when people are coming to me. And have a way to not let them take the initial two-hour consultation and just tell a story. 
I got to give them a new story before they go. Like my goal now is to say, they're coming in with a story. We've all got a story. We're meaning seeking creatures, right? Stories are how we understand the world. Can I at least introduce an alternate story before they leave me? I might not see them again. Some people only come for that initial consultation, but can I get to that in a more gradual way by asking, are they ready? Have they talked enough? Have I heard them enough? The reason that I'm rushing them is because I want to give them their money's worth. I don't actually know what their money's worth is. It's a concept I have in my head that I need to get the plan out to them completely. Maybe that's not exactly the requirement. The requirement is that they feel heard, that they feel hopeful, that there's another um, possibility that I've opened up for them. And if they want to continue, they'll come back. Uh, I'm saying this in such an experimental way to you. It's all new to me. Well, I am um, happy to be your experiment lab. (laughs) Hey, I have a request. Can you repeat those little phrases that you just told us and and repeat them in a way where you give momentary pauses after for everyone to reflect? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, you might have to tag a teacher. You might have to reinforce my pauses. <laughs> I used to wear a, a calculator when I'm teaching to just move a bead every time I took a breath between sentences. Like, it's such a rare thing. <laughs> Do you have a sense I've heard you? Or is there more you'd like me to understand? I'm curious about this. Good. May I ask you a few questions? You know, I have a suggestion. Would you like to hear it now? Or would you prefer to continue with your story? <laughs> those are those are a few I'm working in. I'm working into my conversations. I just realized my podcast editor goes through and r- removes all of the pauses. So that's fantastic. As, <laughs> as the listener of the show, I want you to know that there were dramatic pauses in there. <laughs> But if we forgot to do our editing properly, then um, they might have been removed. So, so the, 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 so I'm also reminded of a saying: uh, "Punishment starts when knowledge ends," which came to my mind. And, and Louise Jinman, uh, head of APDT Australia and uh, head carnival keeper at Toronto Zoo in Sydney, uh, she did on a podcast episode we did together, and. It came to me, that, that thought came to me when you were talking about that guy with his pit bulls uh, in the gardeners coming along and him holding their faces. You know, that seemingly my interpretation of your story is that at, in that moment, his knowledge had stopped him from understanding what the next steps he might take are and he went to punishment. Now, as a consultant, I feel the people that I interact with really get frustrated at that point because you said that was a client of years yeah, but not a training client. They're kind of quirky. What they do is they come to mm. visit my beautiful office with eight fenced acres and they let their dogs run and play in my acreage while they chat with me. So even though they've been my clients for years, I would not say they like or understand training or want to, but they talk to me while their dogs are playing in the pond in the field. So we have conversations. Yeah. Even in that instance, I think it potentially um, falls into uh, where I was trying to steer the conversation next because I feel like it might have value for the uh, listener. And and recently we've been making content on compassion fatigue and burnout uh, and people coming to -to face-to-face with a client like that where their, their expectations are not met. And they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe you did that. So when when you hear that yourself, we're diverging from where we said we would take this uh, podcast episode. But I'm just seeing an opportunity here, so I'm grabbing it. Like, How does Cafe Sadeo process that? How Because I imagine you're, you're a human being. You get frustrated. <laughs> where, where, where does that frustration take you? And how do you? That's such a great question. Um, uh, so I'm going to recommend a book because here's a concept that came to me like, where was this all my life? Um, Christopher Germer, G-E-R-M-E-R. Um, it's a book on self-compassion. I wish I had the title at my hand. Uh, Dr. Christopher Germer, self-compassion, colon, something else. You will find the reference for me, Ryan, and you will keep it with the podcast notes. Um, I, it's my favorite book on self-compassion. But in that book, he says, it's not compassion fatigue, it's attachment to outcome fatigue. Bingo. That was like my mind went, oh, that's why I'm frustrated. And I have to like be a barista now because I've done that you know, animal training thing. It's so frustrating. I'm so attached 
to what clients are going to do. I have, you know, if the dog stays happily with them for its entire natural life, then I've won. I've been a good consultant. And to start to loosen up about that and say, my job is to be fully present with them as best I can in the moment they're with me. I am going to be in the now, back to Eckhart, as best I can with all my expertise, education, ethics, I'm bringing all my compassion to that moment, I'm doing the best I can. And then I'm releasing the outcome to them. They're agents of their own choices. It's not about me losing if they decide something different than I've suggested. There's been so much lightness around that for me. But I also have to be honest, I need a mindfulness practice. So I need a place many people know, maybe not many, but gosh, if you looked at me on Facebook, would you, would you see interesting animal training content? No, you'd see. I go to the beach most every morning with my dog. Rocky Beach, it's not pretty, but it's you know, a mile and a half from my house. I was already there this morning with my dog Smudge, and we look for pottery, and I've been doing that. Mindfulness, I love being on the beach, lose track of time, can let everything go, be refreshed, and come back to my clients for the rest of the day, and even come back to this podcast and go, I'm in the moment with you now because I've let it all go in a way that to me is a form of meditation and prayer. So I don't know how you can get at what you asked without some active way to give yourself the compassion that you're giving every single day to the animals that you work with without any hesitation. If you said, I aspire to be nonviolent, and I say to you, the words that you're saying to yourself as a constant chatter in the back of your head seem pretty violent to me. For many people, including myself, there was an epiphany when I went, I'm part of that sort of creatures I want to be nonviolent to myself. I can share with you, Ryan, that was not how I was raised. That just crazy talk. So self-compassion for me is not only a luxury, how am I going to be my best with my clients? I've got no compassion to give them if I haven't given a little bit to myself. So I'm lighter around the outcomes um, that I would have a few years ago called unsuccessful outcomes to my consultation cases. And now said, there are so many variables in people's lives. I'm one of them. I'm going to try to give them my very best. And I'm going to work hard to up my game, to keep learning and having these conversations and listening to podcasts and going to conferences and reading journal articles and studying Susan Friedman's course. Oh my God, it just makes me so much smarter. But then I'm just going to say, here's what I've got to be able to not beat myself up when it doesn't go the way I'd hoped or expected. I'm going to try to let go of those expectations if I can. It's a new practice for me, but I'm getting better at it. I'm actually sort of lighter about stuff. Now, the clients I had yesterday who were challenging, I actually ended up instead of going home a few years ago, would have had a couple of fingers of bourbon. Would have just said, yeah, it's a bourbon kind of night. And last night I just got home and I just looked back on the day and laughed. I'm just like, wow, people are quirky. You know that? Just people are really quirky. Behavior is infinitely fascinating, including the quirky clients who came to my office. Am I confident that I helped the woman who came to me first off with the screaming chorky? I am not. She left my office perfectly happy, gave me a hug. Did we change the behavior of that dog one iota? No, I don't think so. What are you going to do? Wow. I have so many questions, but (laughs) (laughs) I'm so interested in this topic. I mean, this is super relevant to me. Sorry, podcast listeners. (laughs) Hopefully it helps. It's helpful for you as well. But Kathy, you mentioned, um, we're going to push forward. We're not going to stay here. Because you mentioned uh, nonviolent communication many times uh, in the last uh, 20 minutes or so. And you mentioned the book, Nonviolent Communication, uh, something that you're passionate about, something that you're bringing to Clear Expo. And you've also kindly offered to to bring as you already have and to build on now uh, this to this podcast episode today. And I, I asked you to kind of put together uh, uh, five tips for the listeners of the show, five tips to move them towards what we're labeling as nonviolent communication and maybe just unpack that for everyone again just before you offer those five, t- five tips. But can you can you share what they, those are for the listeners of the show? I can. And if I have just a couple of minutes, I'll tell you how this sort of bubbled up and it was um, my, uh, is cognitive dissonance the right word? No, no, that isn't. My, um, I can't figure it out. I'm stuck. I'm sort of like chewing on this issue of well-known positive reinforcement trainers, people I know, people whose books I've read and are on my shelf I could show you right now, like leaders in my profession on social media, 
posting things in writing, I just can't wrap my mind around. They're frankly violent language to clients or students, typically, sometimes to uh, other trainers who aren't doing it the way that we want. Um, But in a public setting, writing in a way that just seems, don't we have an ethic of non-coercion? And is the ethic really stop when it gets to humans? Like, is that a conscious thing we do? Do we say, yes, um, um, here's the phrase I've been using. It's Murray Sidman's phrase. Oh, can I just take 10 seconds to say how much I adore the book Coercion and it's followed by Murray Sidman. Oh my gosh. If you haven't read it, please read it. If you have read it, please read it again. It is phenomenal, life-changing. Oh my gosh. So much in S-I-D-M-A-N, Coercion and it's fallout. Not a recent book, but a fabulous book. Um, Dr. Sidman's a very clear writer. It reminds me a lot of ways of Karen Pryor's Don't Shoot the Dog. It's a very accessible book that tells you some really deep truths. Okay, so Murray Sidman, behavior analyst, coercion, and fallout. His phrase is positive reinforcement works and coercion is dangerous. That's my new tagline. Like, that's not jargony. That's just like what I do. Positive reinforcement works and coercion. What does he mean by that? The three other quadrants. Positive punishment, negative punishment, negative reinforcement. The three other quadrants. He's going to call them coercion. They're dangerous. In the long run, they're going to backfire and the book's going to explain why. Okay, so is that ethic? Positive reinforcement works and coercion is dangerous. Does it cross over to humans? Do we intentionally say no, only non-human animals? With humans, we get to be coercive. I don't think anybody says that. I think what happens is, as soon as we start to use language, we don't use the skills we've taken on as trainers where we're studying and listening to podcasts and doing all those you know, education bits that let us be excellent. When we're speaking and writing, we're using the skills we learned as kids, which most of us, it wasn't this kind of thing. So how do we say I'm going to intentionally, mindfully bring my ethic of unconditional positive regard and positive reinforcement is that my go-to? How about that humane hierarchy Dr. Friedman teaches us about? Do I embrace that for the difficult client or for the trainer down my street? I am not making this up. I could drive in 20 minutes to a training facility, I use the term very loosely, where dogs in a 10-week class in week six are routinely hung to show the dogs who the leader is. They're not hung on a choke chain contingent on bad behavior. They're just hung in week six. It's, it's, it's so sickening. What, so, so what's my ethic to that trainer? Um, rage uh, most times, but don't I say, um, no, no, that's not how we change behavior. We change behavior. So how do I learn more about that when I go, oh, my speaking and my writing were formed at a time where nobody cared about coercion. Like that was how I learned to do really well throughout my school years. How can I learn something different? I spent this last Saturday at a full day nonviolent communication workshop And with my notebook, like taking notes from the facilitator in Tacoma, Washington, in my church's, you know, um, meeting room. And I'm like a little kid in learning the beginning steps of this is what this format looks like. Great. I've got the words. I've got the formula. I got to practice now. So now I'm part of a practice group that says, boy, we're going to suck at this new way of speaking because it's new, but everybody's not so fluent until you give yourself the time and attention to learn a new skill. So I am just a little, you know, fawning little learner of this new communication system. Is it the only one out there? It's not. You've mentioned Crucial Conversations, another incredibly seminal book which speaks in a little bit of a different language, a little more business oriented, a little more secular. Nonviolent communication is a little uh, more uh, interpersonal relationships and maybe a little less secular. It's not a religious text, but it speaks about spirituality. They overlap a lot, um, but from a crucial conversations, nonviolent communication, whichever form you're taking on, it's a way to be able to say, that's the recipe book I'm taking off the shelf to learn to cook um, Thai food because I've never cooked it before and I really need step-by-step instructions to start me off. After a while, I'm going to be able to, you know, ad lib my Thai food cooking, but I need a format right now. So nonviolent communication is a very clear format. Um, And again, it's not the the formula. It's the uh, emphasis on wanting to connect always wanting to make a connection with whatever being you're communicating with. So I'm sorry, that was a lot of background to your saying, can you give us five tips? I actually have my five tips written down, but I'm going to take a break because maybe I just threw us off track. Did I throw us off track, right? 
Hey, uh, I said to you when we caught up last week that the uh, aim of the show is to get you to steal from Theresa McEwen and passion talking. And what does that look like? That looks like you saying, I, I gave you an example saying, what was the question again? If you ask me that, I'll know I've done my job. But I'm, I might add this one to it when I speak to future possible guests. Another opera, opera, opera realization I can't speak for this morning apparently, um, of passion talking is, have I thrown you off track, Ryan? So... <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying that's a good thing that I've sort of lost the thread here. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm, I'm intending to um, reinforce this behavior. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty fluent in me going on tangents. So thanks a lot for that. <laughs> but please, um, please do show us uh, your your five five tips for implementing uh, nonviolent communication. Okay. So I pulled off five from a list of maybe, I don't know, 15 or so at the end of my uh, Clicker Expo presentation on this. And I'll, I'll tell you a secret. <laughs> we're, um, we're in the planning stages for next year's Clicker Expos in the United States. Um, so they will be in uh, Seattle in January. Yay. Seattle in January. I can drive to it. And, um, Louisville, Kentucky in March, but the planning is happening right now for what the uh, program will look like. And there's a conversation about, would it be good to have a lab, not just a lecture, me on the podium talking about nonviolent communication, but us all practicing what that would look like in a lab setting. So I'm hoping that'll be part of next year's expo where we'll put some of these uh, tips into practice. Um, for now, I'll give you five of the suggestions that I've made as a teacher, but also that I'm doing. So this is me in it with you. This is the one topic that I teach where I'm very aware. I'm not an expert teaching to an audience who I assume most of you know somewhat less than I know about the topic. I feel like, hey, I'm, I'm in it with you. Let's have this conversation as a group and see if we can move our profession in this direction. It would some, be something I'd want to do. All right. First tip, take one day do an ethogram on yourself. So ethogram, watching the behaviors of another organism. I started off at the Aquarium of Niagara Falls doing an ethogram on the Atlantic bottlenose dolphins that were there. So I'd sit with a notepad and I'm checking off behaviors that they're doing as I'm, you know, just quietly watching them at the side of their tank. Do an ethogram on yourself and just for a day or even two, just notice how you use the words us and them. Just pay attention how they come up in your language. What do you mean by us and them? I told a story at Click Arts, but I'm not sure it got across, but I'm going to try it here as well. My mother was a first grade teacher. Um, and so when I was a little girl, I'm thinking five or six, and I would say to her in the evenings, mom, can I help you get ready for class the next day? Like, what can I do to help you prepare your lessons, right? I just want to be doing something with my mom. And she would like take a coloring book and she'd rip out the picture, really simple line drawing of an animal, let's say a camel. So she'd give me the like simple line drawing of a camel. And she would say to me, here, take a magic marker and go over the outline of the camel. Make it a stronger, darker outline. She's going to use them as flashcards for her first grade class. So she's basically saying, make that border around the camel bigger and darker with your magic marker. And I'm sure it was just busy work as in retrospect, but I loved it. I'm like, I'm helping my mom get ready for class. Do you know that I metaphorically do that magic marker exercise all the time? I draw a line all the time between us, the good trainers, the positive reinforcement trainers, the clicker trainers, um, my political party, um, whatever. And them, the, the crazy political party, the guy down the street who's hanging dogs, the them. But that idea of saying there is a big black dividing line, there's a chasm, that separateness doesn't give me any influence on you. So this great line, um, Martin Luther King Jr., I mean, gosh, infinite great lines, but um, him saying, you have no influence over anyone who can perceive your contempt for them. Anyone who perceives that you have contempt for them, you have zero influence. And you know, I want to have influence on my clients and my colleagues. I want to be someone who inspires. And that contempt of them, that finger pointing, they know it. So as I start to go, what would it look like to build connections across that big black line, that chasm of us and them? What does the connection look like? I have to say Brene Brown's work. I met someone uh, last week who said, who? I'm like, oh my gosh, have you never heard of Brene Brown? Because you're going to love me for turning you on to that brilliant woman's body of work, which is phenomenal. 
I looked at a tweet from Brene Brown this morning that if I could show you the tweet, I'm like, yes, right in what I'm talking about. So her most recent book, Braving the Wilderness, would be the third one uh, for me, Crucial Conversations, Nonviolent Communication, Brene Brown's Braving the Wilderness on how to have these difficult conversations, right? So to be able to say, you want to build connections. You want to be able to have that conversation. Do you need to agree with the people you call them? Am I agreeing with the hanging? Oh, no. With every morsel of my being, with every bit of my soul, I disagree with it. Um, But I'm not going to be able to influence that trainer or his apprentices um, in any way to change their behavior if they think I have contempt. And that finger pointing them the screeds that we write on Facebook, the just venting you do on Facebook, just think about it. Just think about as you just vent on Facebook, did you just take your magic marker and draw the big black line? Eh, us and them. Um, I'll quote from nonviolent communication. People's bad behavior, their rudeness, their anger, their stupidity is them poorly expressing something they need. So the heart of nonviolent communi- communication says we all have needs everybody, animals, non, you know, human animals, non-human animals. We all have needs. That's part of existence. We all try to get our needs met. We often have bad ways of doing that. So bad behavior comes from this unfulfilled need. Uh, when I talked about this topic at Luminos and Jesus Rosales Ruiz was in the room, the Clicker Expo that was in England last year with a different format. And my, you know, one of my mentors and friends, Jesus Rosales Ruiz came to me after that. And he said, I like your talk on unbalanced communication. I'm like, you did? It's sort of touchy-feely. I wasn't sure you would like it. And he said, I just want to call out something for you. When you're talking about nonviolent communication, you're calling them needs. We behavior analysts call them reinforcers. I'm like, oh, duh. Like there's so much overlap between saying you need reinforcers, Ryan. I do too. That's not a flaw. That's how we exist. And from that, springs all our behaviors. Some of them we like, some of them we don't, but they come from these unmet needs. Can we help um, folks get their needs met in another way? And it's actually how I had the conversation with Murray yesterday. Instead of going, oh my gosh, please don't grab those dog's faces. Like that's terrible. He had an unmet need. There's chaos in his house. His dog, big dogs are going crazy for three hours. That's not okay. You have a need for some peace in your house. I've been to his house. It's a beautiful, lovely, zen kind of place. It really is. So I could just imagine the 200 pounds of screaming pit bull for three hours. What's his unmet need? How else can we help him meet his need? It comes from that idea of whatever behavior you're seeing in that person or seeing online, there's an unmet need there. Can we get that need met another way? It, it fits right in to what we do with um, clicker training and behavior analysis. You want me to, for me to go on to three? Do you want me to take a breath? Um, you can go on to three. You think? But please do breathe. I'm tagulating you as you go. Okay. I'm breathing. Uh, so speaking of social media, I have a dream. <laughs> Sorry. Not in any way trying to emulate Martin Luther King Jr., please. But I, I, I would aspire to, we have an option on social media to colluding with a colleague who's expressing heartache in a violent way. We have a tough job. And often when we're disappointed in how a case worked out or we're frustrated with a student or we watch some brutal training, we get on social media and instead of saying, my heart is broken, I don't really know what to do with this hurt, we're angry. And so our friends will get down in that thread and go, yeah, you go girl, me too. I had that happen as well. It turns into this sort of In our attempts to be compassionate and empathetic with our our friends, we're colluding in something that's, I don't know, feel like it's not our best. Um, So I wonder if there isn't a way we can go, what else can I do to say I'm here? I totally hear you. That is hard, but not fan the flames of what is rehearsing attacking. Like we don't want to rehearse that behavior. I found an emoji, who knew, I'm not social media savvy at all, um, that's been designed in the last couple of years. There's an anti-bullying emoji. It is two emojis combined. It's an eyeball inside of a um, speech bubble. If you Googled anti-bullying emoji, you would see it. It was designed to help kids be able to say on social media, I'm a witness. I'm watching. I'm here. I'm here. I see what's happening. I see you're being bullied. I don't want to be part of the actual bullying, but I also don't want to stay silent. I don't want to just go, I'm turning off Facebook, which I did for months and months. Like, I can't deal. 
How can I be present in a way that says, here I am. I, that is hard. I hear you. That's a tough place to be in, but not fan this. Oh my gosh, me too. I have stupid clients. You know what? I can do one better. My client was worse than what, where is this coming from? The unmet need that this is a hard job that we do. I think, um, another book, maybe this is all just book recommendations. Um, I listened to the book Atomic Habits uh, a few weeks ago by James Clear. I think there's a there's at least a handful of books on like habit formation. They're trendy. They're cool. The Power of Habit and Mini Habits. And and I listened to this book without much hope I would learn much. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know that stuff. And I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. So James Clare, Atomic Habits. And by atomic, he means teeny, teeny, tiny, like start super small, split your criteria down to something so easy you can't possibly fail at the new habit you're trying to create. I, I touched my new meditation mat yesterday. I have a meditation mat. Am I sitting on the meditation mat and meditating? I am not yet. <laughs> so yesterday I was sitting on a stool and I'm like, I am so rushed. I put my hand on the meditation mat. I'm like, all right, that's a shaping step toward you will sit for 20 minutes in meditation. I will get there. Um, but one of the um, atomic habits I do on my morning walk is called benevolent glancing. Benevolent glancing means silently I'm walking on the waterfront in Tacoma and there I'm walking next to a busy road where people are rushing to work. And months ago, I would have said to you during that lovely walk in beautiful Tacoma, Washington with Mount Rainier in front of me and Commencement Bay, it's just lovely. My mind is drawn to the traffic, which is speeding and tailgating and crossing. the. It, it's, it's like crazy traffic. Like it makes me just, oh my gosh, like stop that. So what I've tried to start doing is say, I'm going to look at the water. I'm going to look at the mountain ahead of me. And I'm going to glance over and actually look at the person driving that car. I'm going to look at a person just benevolently. I'm going to, am I going to love them? No, I'm just actually going to go like, I wish you well in your day. I'm not looking at your bad tailgating, your terrible driving. I'm just going to do these little doses of take a stranger, wish them well, go back to your walk again. I know this sounds silly, but it's me with a shaping program for myself on what is being instantly ready to give unconditional positive regard to any human. I'm going to practice that first step. Where's my brain go when I look at any stranger? Well, that stupid thing you're wearing. Oh my God, I can't believe you got that hair stuff. Like I am instantly in snark mode at the airport. Like you could just sit in an airport chair and you're waiting for your flight and you're like, oh my gosh, that person's cl-. whatever. It's such a habit, right? To nitpick. So I want to start to develop the habit of like, hey, you're going to work. Have a good day. Am I saying that? No. Do they know I'm glancing at them? I don't know, on some level maybe, but they're not seeing me. Benevolent glancing, the atomic habit of me going, yeah, I want to have connection with my species in a way that, yeah, it's not coming easily for me yet, but I'm going to keep practicing. The last one, I think this is something our profession needs to do more of, and that's having peer partners so that we can practice our nonviolent communication. We can say, hey, you're my practice partner. And on Thursdays at noon, I'm going to get together and say for a half hour, hey, this is how my week went. Here's the tough cases I had. Do I want you to help me fix that case? Give me, no, 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 no. This is not a, like, we're coming up with solutions. I'm just sharing my difficult client, my good client. I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of my, whoo, here's what my week is look like. You know what? If we were going to do any practicing at all with my peer partner, someone else who's sort of my, you know, my, uh, empathy buddy, um, what would a conversation look like where I could have said that differently? Or when I'm meeting with this client again, we come up with a couple of scripts I could try. Like it would be easier to do this with partners in a way where you give it some practice. So we set time aside for agility class and, you know, practicing my freestyle moves with smudge. And yeah, how about practicing with somebody who says, yeah, I want to get better at that too. It's part of my professional ethic and I could do better. I think it's going to be a trend. So anyway, I think moving forward, um, I think we're going to see more of that. I have a client who is a psychiatrist and she works with um, really high risk populations, um, highly suicidal populations. She has a very difficult caseload she's lovely. She's one of my favorite clients. She said, I'd lose my credentials as a psychiatrist. I'd lose my license if I didn't have a peer partner meeting once a week. I've met with the same people now by phone, conference call, 
um, every Thursday, and I have to. It's part of my keeping my license. I never heard of that before. I didn't realize that was a thing. How come it's not a thing for us? I think maybe it gets to be a thing because the work we do is hard. And if we don't transform that difficulty into uh, better communication skills, I think we get bitter, uh, we get snarky, we get on Facebook when we're feeling heartbroken and we write something that, yeah, we're just regretting later. It's sort of that immediate gratification of someone else is going to go, yeah, that sucked for you, Kathy. I want an option. I want an option of what to do with that difficulty. And uh, yeah, I think our profession is going to move that way. I'm hearing some hopeful things. So I'm going to repeat those five back to you in my own words. (laughs) So number one, take an ephagram. Notice how you use the words us and them in ephagram of yourself. Measure your own behavior. Number two, uh, how can we help people meet their needs? I.e., how can we identify uh, what reinforces are in their life and deliver them to them for what we might label as more desirable behavior? I don't know what to do with this. Is number three, I don't know what to do with this hurt. If someone comes on social media potentially from that angle um, just acknowledging how we might be reinforcing that behavior and some alternative consequences we can deliver Um, number three is benevolent glancing as an example but an example of shaping your behavior change instead of lumping and number four is have sorry number five is have pair partners how did i do you did great. You lost the numbering a little bit there, but maybe that's a New Zealand thing. <laughs> <laughs> we don't count in this country. Um, yeah. Let's look at the time. Let's actually <laughs> not unpack that anymore, even <laughs> though uh, I would like to. However, there have been numerous book references throughout this podcast, so there are plenty of next steps for you to take as the listeners. I know I'll be taking myself. We are at the final question for this episode, Kathy, and I'm really interested to to hear what you have to say here. And I always find that at this point, we can probably guess some of the things that you would like to see change over the coming five to 10 years. But to build on everything you've already said, what do you really want to see uh, happen in our industry with dog trainers and animal training uh, over the coming while? It's a really tough question. It's hard for me to see that far into the future, but I don't know what some version of, and this is such a thicket, But there's got to be a way. Um, It's not legal uh, for the trainer down the street to be making a choice because hanging works. Like it's got, you know, Susan Friedman's wonderful article, Effectiveness is Not Enough. I don't know what that licensing, credentialing legalities would look like. It's such a thicket. But it does feel um, like we're in a really, especially in the United States, which is what I know, in a really difficult time for just consumers, people who want good advice and to say that the humane hierarchy isn't, or any algorithm isn't standard practice, it's something you can sort of choose or not. It just seems so odd to me that, um, yeah, we're not uh, more cohesive in what best practices look like and to put some teeth behind um, making that be, yeah, something that's, that's easier for consumers to suss out, basically. So that would be one of them. Um, I'd love our profession to continue to be treated um, as a profession or to to raise it. Um, If we want to be treated as professionals, um, we need to be serious about understanding the science and our continuing education and continuing to improve our own best practices. But the piece of it that I feel like I want to come into it is how do we take care of ourselves? As we get uh, longer in the tooth in this, it's my colleagues that have been doing this for 20 and 30 years, which I think are most at risk of fleeing. You know, I have a slide in my Clicker Expo presentation called Flea Control, F-L-E-E. Like I need my colleagues who've been doing this for two and three decades to stay in the profession. It's to my best interest to have this super educated, experience people not retire um, do some other thing because it's so hard so to support people in their compassion fatigue or attachment to outcome fatigue that piece of educating ourselves I think is getting more attention but I'm very much behind feeding the feeders like we're out there being positive reinforcement coaches and then we're very often like empty. So how do we keep that flow going where we're being well fed so that we can continue to give it out? So I'm 
I'm hoping that becomes standard practice for us to be taking care of ourselves in a way that lets us have good, long, effective careers and our influence. Oh my gosh, Ryan, you know, we can change the world. You're on one end of the world. I'm at, we're literally on opposite ends of the world right now. And we're both spending our time today going, it's here. If you learn to modify the behavior of one living being, one living being, you've opened up like the, the Rosetta Stone for like, I can do it anywhere, anytime. It changes everything for us to understand how behavior actually works. Our profession is important. It's doing amazing things on this planet. If it weren't, you and I should be spending our time doing other things. We have other options. We could be spending our limited lives elsewhere at our passion. All this passion talking comes from, we love our world and we love our species and we can all do better together. So here's our contribution. Let's not give up because it gets so hard that we go, I'm, I'm self-employed. I, I'm working by myself. I don't have another employee or partner, business partner. So I'm doing this work by myself. And at the end of a long day, what are my options? Let's have some options to say, yeah, there's a lot of professions that the work is hard, um, but we need our pediatric oncologist and my psychiatrist who's working with suicidal population. We need those folks to continue doing what they're so gifted at doing. We're in that club. We need to take care of ourselves. Um, so we're in it for the long haul. And yeah, I think we're going to put more emphasis on that. I know I am. So I'm doing my little share of it. Keep feeding the feeders. And I like it. It's going to be uh, rolling around in my mind. I'm probably going to repeat it numerous times today to everyone I speak to. Uh, is it bourbon hour when you get home? Or are we also giving <laughs> I'm saying, is it bourbon hour when you get home? Or are we uh, yeah. increasing our choice and control for ourselves? <laughs> and sometimes the choice will be for bourbon, but I don't want that to be the default <laughs> response, right? Like that's not a good direction. <laughs> your future behavior will tell you where your reinforcement is. <laughs> hey, we did it at the start of the show, Kathy, but once again, can you just remind everyone listening where they can go to get in touch and find out more information, including your updated schedule? <laughs> <laughs> if you give me a day or two, <laughs> this is coming find out in my updated hours. seminar, workshop, webinar schedule at kathysadeo.com. And you can also email me from uh, my website as well. Wonderful. And everything we've talked about today in the show, now I'm setting up expectations for the listeners of the show. We will endeavor to the best of our ability uh, to link to all of the things we've talked about in the show today. We've, we've mentioned many different resources, so we'll do our best. Hey, Kathy, uh, this has been so much fun. So from myself and on behalf of everyone listening today, thank you so much for, for making time to come and hang out with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. You do good work and I hope you just keep doing it. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Remember, anything you resist persists. If you have enjoyed the episode today and you're interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of the episode, the ATA Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com. Click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media, good social media platform where people behave appropriately. <laughs> social media platform for behavior geeks. There's something there for absolutely everyone. We're looking forward very much to having you come and join the tribe. The tribe that's inclusive of everyone. There's no them in us. <laughs> that's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much everyone for listening and you'll hear from us again soon. Mm -hmm.